Well, we're back in prayer in Matthew chapter 6, and uh, I love this section, and I love our thought about prayer itself. Jesus is teaching us not only the what of, of following him, in other words, the things to do in order to follow him uh, as our rabbi, as our uh, you know, master and teacher, but uh, he's also teaching us how to do it. He's telling us how to do uh, giving the right way and how, how to fast the right way and how to pray the right way uh, so that we can get that exciting reward from the Father who sees all things done in secret. And so a couple of the things we've done just in terms of background and context is we talked about you know the question, what was prayer life like in, in Jewish practice in the time of Jesus? And then we moved last week in our last study together, we asked the question, what was Jesus' own prayer life like? Uh, and so we studied a little bit about that and saw some really interesting and powerful snapshots from the life of Jesus in his own prayer life. It's really amazing. We know that the Father always hears Jesus, and the things that Jesus prayed about are very moving because uh, he prayed for us. He prayed for his immediate disciples, but he also prayed for all those who would believe through their word. Uh, and so Jesus glorifies his Father in his prayers, and we should do the same. But I want to pause uh, in a very brief session tonight to think about for just a moment how not to pray. And the reason I want to do that is, and I know that sounds a little negative, but the reason I want to do that is because Jesus does it here in, in Matthew chapter 6. He actually talks about how not to pray. You know, if you think about it, uh, maybe the first thing we might say about that is um, we should be very aware of our own prayer life and if we're not praying at all. I think uh, for a lot of us, if we were to be very, very honest about it, we don't have a very healthy prayer life. And I think, you know, just on the surface of it, there are two you know, big reasons that I can think about why people don't pray more and don't pray at all. The first is they just don't think about it. They're so caught up in their own schedules and in their own lives that they don't pause and they really their minds aren't really Godward that much anyway unless it's on a Sunday or uh, maybe it's a Wednesday or something of that nature and maybe then it's a, a, a thought but we just don't think to pray we don't include God in our everyday details of our lives and a second reason maybe we don't pray is because we just don't think we'll be heard because we're not good enough let me say about that last one, you're right, you're not good enough. <laughs> if Scripture teaches us anything, we're all imperfect. And the great thing is that God still invites us to pray. He wants us to speak to Him from the heart and to uh, really converse with Him. Um, and that's, that's true. And we're always imperfect. None of us would ever dare say that we have a perfect slate or that we are perfect people. Uh, all of us have, have problems in our lives. And, and yet, God still invites us to, to talk to Him. And so we should take advantage of that. And so, verse 5 of chapter 6, When you pray, Jesus says, you have to be very, very careful about how you do it. Don't do it so that your righteousness will be seen before others. You can't be theatrical with your prayers. Jesus uh, you know, he doesn't want that. Uh, he wants your righteousness to be concerned with the heart, doing good for the right motive. And he is concerned in this chapter about dramatically doing good in order to be noticed. There's nothing more repelling than to see a preacher or someone on television, uh, somebody who uh, has something to say speaking for God, who apparently is doing that in order to be theatrical or in order to be noticed. Uh, they have some sort of either monetary motivation for it or uh, they have uh, some need inherent within them own, their own selves um, to be praised. And Jesus is very much against that. He calls them hypocrites from hypocriti, meaning stage performers. You know, if you think about it, when you're a kid, um, it's very normal for a child to look to their parent and say, hey, look at me, look at what I can do, look at this skill I've learned, or look at this accomplishment. That's a normal thing. 
because children want their parents to be proud of them. And I think there's something good about that. There's something ingrained within our own hearts that we want God to look to us with approval, to notice us, to notice us in a good way. I think the child's watch me becomes the adult's more unspoken but just as deep. Notice me. All of us as adults, we in some way want people very significant to us to notice us. And so I think we were made to notice God and to be noticed by God. That, there's something of faith in that. And so when Jesus talks about uh, being noticed by God in the right way, he highlights three practices. He highlights giving, he highlights prayer, and he highlights fasting. And I don't know if you ever noticed or thought about this or not, but uh, those really represent a person's three main relationships in life. Because giving, that has to do with our relationship with other people. Prayer has to do with our relationship with God. And fasting has to do with our relationship to ourselves in light of God. So all of these are, are very powerful, and they serve a very important practice. And so as you look in Matthew chapter 6, you'll notice the verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Jesus outlines for us how not to pray. Very interesting. And then in verses 9 through 15, which we're headed towards, he highlights how we should pray. And so we could label verses 5 through 8 a wrong prayer, where Jesus destroys widely held ideas about prayer. And in verses 9 through 15, he's going to clear, having cleared the rubble, he's now going to build a new structure that's very majestic, which we could call right prayer. And it looks like that. So let's start out with wrong prayer. Let's look at the first couple of verses in Matthew chapter 6. And notice he says, in essence, we should not be showy in our prayers because God sees. And in fact, he sees down into the deepest core of our hearts. So notice verse 5. When you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they've already received their reward. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So the ancient rabbis had rules that they had put into effect which forbade the devout to pray loudly in public. And so they already had this idea to, to watch out for people who are looking for attention and to watch out for people who are looking to be very outwardly demonstrative with their faith in order to draw attention to themselves. And instead, uh, the, the rabbinic literature talks about prayer that was done softly. Uh, if you were to pull up a video on the Ju Jerusalem Wailing Wall, you'll maybe see some of those practices which continue down to this very day. Jesus is not impressed when people pray loudly and in a, a showy manner. In fact, if you think about private devotion, that's really what Jesus is after. And if you added the word public to the Words private devotion, a public private devotion. They don't fit very well together. It's an oxymoron. And so how can you direct your faith toward God and towards people at the same time? You don't do one very well if you do the other one with the bad motive. And so this leads to some applicational questions. Jesus doesn't want you to be very showy or, or outward with your prayers. So, I mean, what does that do for us with, you know, times when we sit down as a family or with friends and we want to say a prayer over our meal? Well, table grace, you know, we call, call it sometimes. Well, that is a public prayer, and, and I think it can be done appropriately. And Jesus isn't addressing that here. But I do think disciples should guard against being uh, ostentatious with their prayers or showy with their prayers, even in a setting like praying at the table. What about public prayers in, in corporate worship? I think you know, there are moments where all of us have been in a worship assembly and some guy got up and he started praying and before he knew it, it just turned into a sermon. And that's not really a prayer. Uh, a prayer in worship is to God exclusively. 
And as our minds collectively join with the words of the person praying, we might also get something out of that. But the words are directed towards God. And so they can't be a disguised sermon. That's not a prayer. Jesus urges prayer in families and in the church as a means of spiritually growing and becoming more powerful. But, but here we, we're talking about group prayer, and it thrives only where private prayer is practiced. So let me say that again. Your corporate prayers and worship together, they're going to only become more effective and more powerful as you get better and better at praying privately. And so when you think about private prayer, look back at your verse 6 for a minute. He says, but when you, this is singular here. The Greek word here is singular. When you, and it's emphasized, when you pray, go into your supply room, lock the door, pray to your father in secret. And your father who is watching there in secret, he will reward you. You know, in in old ancient Palestinian homes, especially Palestinian farms, the supply room might be the only place on the farm that has a lock on the door. And they would do that to keep, you know, food for the animals and all of that, you know, tools, whatever. And it might seem like the least holy place, but this is the place where you can be privately in conversation with God. So it's a good place to pray, Jesus says. And so he's revising prayer. So you had all of these, you had all these complex thoughts about prayer as a follower of, of Judaism in the first century. You know, they had the 18 benedictions. They would pray the Shema, you know, 40 times a day sometimes. And so Jesus, he takes all of that and he says, let me whittle down what prayer really is. It's, it's you speaking to God from the heart. You do so privately. You don't, you're not showy with it, but you're really opening up to God. And maybe your prayer needs to be in a meeting place between only you and God. It's private. And, and you don't have to be in the Holy of Holies over in the temple. You can just be in the room in your house that has a lock on it. That's a pretty astonishing thought. So Jesus knows that we can especially draw near to God in privacy. I dare you. I dare you just to go by yourself, some room, no paper to read, no apps on your phone, turn your phone off, no television, no radio, and just sit for a moment and think about your relationship with your God, and converse with them. Jesus knows this is where you especially draw near to God. It's it's in privacy. So the last couple of verses we'll look at is in verses 7 and 8. And so if Jesus has already said you shouldn't be showy in your prayers because God already sees even down into the heart. In verses 7 and 8, now Jesus is going to say that your prayers should not include a whole lot. <laughs> Because he already knows. God already knows every detail of your life. And in fact, he knows your personality and your secrets and the details of your life at a far deeper level than even you know about them. And so in verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask them. So in Jesus' day, the people felt really overburdened by prayer. For a lot of ancient people, they repeated their prayers over and over and over again. And Jesus confronts this idea, putting up a stone wall against it. Don't be like them. You know, the Gentiles, they would pray to their gods. You just think about um, the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. They just prayed over and over and over again. And, you know, the prophet taunted them, you know, maybe your God's asleep and he can't hear you. Keep praying. Uh, They prayed needlessly with repetition. And when you think of the Jews, you know, they had all of these set prayers and all these structured prayers. And so I think what Jesus is saying here is keep praying regularly. but, But God especially listens to those who ask, who seek, who knock. He already knows. You don't need to do all of this needless repetition. Just let your heart connect to the heart of God. Well, 
we might have some other questions about praying to a God who already knows what we need before we ask, and we might address those in our next study together. But for right now, we can end by just simply contemplating this thought. What does it mean to you to know that you have a God who knows you better than you even know yourself and who cares about you more than any other person? could ever care about you. That's valuable. In Jesus' name, His love is burning in our hearts like living flames.